Next, we will welcome Da Hua Nin uh, from the Chinese University of Hong Kong to uh, share his experience uh, in, uh, the, in video understanding. So Da Hua Nin is an associate professor at the Department of Information Engineering at uh, the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, he is also a co-founder of Sense Time and the director of CUHK Sense Time Joint Lab. So he received the PhD degree from MIT in 2012. And his research interest uh, covers computer vision, machine learning, and big, big data. And, and he has published over uh, 150 papers on top conferences and journals. So uh, welcome, uh, Professor Da Hua Nin. OK, so can you see the slides? Uh, yeah. Uh, so great. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I guess it's very late in Asian areas. Um, but it's a very special form of conferences where um, uh, we can meet each other in this very special period. In today's talk, uh, we are going to share a very important area in computer vision, which is action understanding. And I'm also going to share how uh, open MM Lab, and in particular, uh, one of its library called MM Action 2 can be used to support the research in this area. So action recognition uh, has been a central topic for years in the community of computer vision. Uh, the task is pretty much well defined. Mm, given a video, uh, in this task, we are to output a label to describe which category the uh, action video belongs to. Okay. On this slide, you can see three videos, and we can respectively categorize those videos into uh, three different classes, like cutting a watermelon, uh, presenting the weather forecast, or climbing a rope. And this kind of application is very useful in many viewer uh, situations. Uh, for example, when you have a monitoring system and when you want to organize all the video, millions of videos on the internet, you need to give them some semantic labels in order uh, to support the higher level actions. And beyond action recognition for video understanding, we have some more sophisticated tasks. Uh, for instance, temporal action localization uh, is a more challenging task. In this task, um, you not only need to uh, give the label of the video, but also you want to localize uh, the moments of interest uh, over long and trim videos. So here you have two outputs, the labels, as well as the, the temporal interval uh, of the moment of interest. And recently, uh, in this community, an even more challenging task called spatial temporal action detection uh, is gathering uh, increasing attention. So in this task, when you try to localize a specific action, you not only have to output the temporal interval, you also have to predict or output um, the spatial location uh, of the action. Uh, for example, here, there's a two men standing uh, facing each other. And when we try to localize the action, in, in addition to describing that there's two men standing over there, we have to output the bounding boxes on every frame to describe uh, where the, these two people stand. And this action recognition temporal action detection and spatial temporal action detection are the three major tasks that the computer vision community have been working on and have been very active working on over the past 10 years. And all these tasks are very difficult and compared to uh, image recognition or object detection based on images, videos actually provide additional dimension, which is a temporal dimension. So, and video can be considered uh, as a sequence of frames, and the frames are arranged along time. And with this temporal dimension, the content actually conveyed. When you look at the video content, it conveys not only the appearance, but also the change of the appearance 
or the motion of the object over there. So in order to understand a video effectively, you not only have to understand the appearance, but you, can, you should also understand what's happening uh, from the perspective of motion. An optical flow is a very widely used machinery to describe the motion in the video in a frame per frame basis. So action recognition has been, as a research topic, has existed for decades. But before 2014, when deep learning was introduced to this area, uh, the performance of action recognition has been in a very um, unsatisfactory level. So you rarely see practical systems which uses action recognition as a key component 10 or 20 years ago. But all we all know that in one uh, year 2012, 2013, deep learning has become uh, increasingly popular in this area and this community. And also um, in action recognition, deep learning uh, was tried and eventually becomes popular. And over the past seven, eight years, there's a fleet important revolution of technologies in deep learning for video understanding. In early days, uh, two stream convolutional network, which use two branches, one for appearance and the other for motion, have shown a uh, promising performance compared to traditional uh, handcrafted feature-based methods. And around two, three years later, uh, three-dimensional convolutions has been introduced and people figure out a specific ways to make a 3D convolution effective in, for video recognition. And since then, it becomes more and more popular and now a de facto standard when you design uh, video recognition networks. And recently, as we all know, that uh, transformer-based models uh, has achieved a number of breakthroughs in natural language processing, and it shows uh, its extraordinary capability for modeling long-range uh, connections. And transformer in recent years, especially in recent works, have also been introduced for action recognition and for video modeling. Okay. And the foreign slides, we are going to briefly revisit some of those methods as it actually marks the evolution of this area. So the early um, seminal work on using deep learning for action recognition is called the two-stream convolutional network. Um, it was uh, initially proposed by uh, Andrew Sisman and his colleagues. The basic idea is that we consider video um, as a certain entity which is comprised of two key aspects, appearance and motion. Okay. So for this two stream network, it consists of two branches. Each branch in itself is a convolutional backbone, respectively for extracting the features for appearance and the other for extracting the features for uh, of motions, which are usually represented as optical flows. And each convolutional network will produce uh, the probability class responses. And then those class responses will then be integrated uh, to produce the final output. And it turns out that this very simple design of models becomes very effective, especially when compared to traditional uh, methods. So since its inception, it becomes extremely popular and widely used in practice. In 2016, um, another very important uh, work uh, was proposed. As you know, when we try to use convolutional network, for example, to stream networks to process videos, it actually have to essentially multiple copies of convolutional level to process the videos on a frame by frame basis. And this is a very time consuming. And it also um, is very difficult to cover very long temporal range due to the limited memory capacity. 
So in order to address this problem, the researchers recognize that in video, there's a lot of redundancy. Generally, we can see that consecutive frames are very similar to each other. So it can just a waste of time and waste of computing resources to recompute the CNN features for every frame or every sort interval. So the idea of temporal segmental network is just to divide the video into multiple segments, no matter how long it is. And for each segment, we just extract one snippet and derive the uh, spatial features as well as the motion features therefrom. At the end of the day, we are going to integrate the features which we extract from each individual segment. And then with a consensus function, we can have the final results. And it turns out that for longer video, for example, those videos that last over one minute or even several minutes, it is very effective because it can have an effective long-term pro coverage so that you can have a broader view, even though at the expense of losing some of the uh, subtle difference within a single segment. But what it gains is a longer uh, temporal coverage for a long video. So it's been very effective. And with the temporal segmental network, we achieved lump one place in the first uh, activity net competition in year 2016. And both the two stream network and also uh, the mm, temporal segmental network, they're also based on two streams. And this kind of a model design, they're still based on two dimensional convolution, but just that you have one branch where the two dimensional convolution uh, are designed to operate on optical flow maps. But people are still wondering whether we can actually capture this entire 3D dynamics uh, through a more sophisticated operation, such as a three dimensional convolution. And this idea is actually emerged and it comes back to year 2013. But at that, those days, people haven't figured out a very effective way to use them to use three dimensional convolution. And two dimensional evolution on two streams becomes more effective. But and when it, the time comes to year 2017, the more effective way of using fluid convolution have been figured out. And it turns out that these operators can show a powerful uh, performance in capturing the 3D dynamics of a video. And there's a different ways of using uh, three-dimensional convolution, like C3D, I3D, and also this is CSN. And in the following slides, we're going to introduce one specific way, uh, and also very popular and effective way, uh, uh, and come back to year 2017. It's called inflative 3D convolution. And the basic idea is that we have very powerful and very nice picture models uh, which were pictured on something like yeah, ImageNet. And why not we just inherit uh, the nice property in the nice knowledge just captured in those picture models. But just that how we can actually turn those image-based picture models into the sense that can operate on videos. The idea is that we try to do inflate. So the basic idea is that for every convolutional network, we just with multiple pages and then stack them together into a 3D convolutional lab and then we scale it appropriately. Okay. And this is called a 3D convolution kernel inflated from a pretend 2D kernel. Awesome. Again, a very simple strategy, but very effective. Okay. Mm, but people later figure out that uh, these 3D kernels are very expensive expensive to compute, especially when you are given a uh, limited computational budget. So what you can do here is that, again, we can do decomposition. So generally we said that the spatial convolution and the temporal convolution, we just decompose the 3D into the composition of a 3D kernel, a 2D kernel, spatial kernel, and a one-dimensional temporal kernel. 
And that's the basic idea behind what's called R2 plus one dimension. Okay. And experimental results shows that this decomposition, while it's significantly reducing the number of parameters as well as the computational complexity, it pretty much maintains the expressive power as well as the recognition performance compared to more expensive full-fledged three-dimensional convolution networks. And in order to further reduce the computational cost, another approach was proposed, which is try to cut the connection across channels. So in a general standard convolution, every input channel is connected to every output channels. So you can imagine that the number of connections grows quadratically as the number of channels increases for each layer. And in order, but people found that this is unnecessary. So in order to cut the number of connections and thus the computational complexity, we first divide the sense into divide the channels into multiple groups and only allow pairwise uh, across channel connections within each group. And if you go along this phase, you go to the stream, then you get this what we call the depth five convolution, and every group contains only a single channel, so there's a no cross channel connections. So by specifying the channel connections, we can get further reduction of computational cost. But if you do it cleverly, you can still pretty much contain, maintain the performance. And then um, later in uh, year 2019, uh, our rally representative work um, by Fair. Uh, it's uh, proposed, uh, it's published in that year 2019. In this work, a very imp important insight was is the publicity presented. The insight is that when we consider a video, it's two aspects, the appearance and the motion. We found that they change at different rate. In generally, in a video, appearance changes slowly, while motions, usually changes quickly, okay? So based on this observation, people hypothesize that you don't have to get features from the appearance channel as frequently as from the motion channel, okay? So now the idea is that we design a more economical network where we extract features from the appearance channel with much larger interval, while we have a more frequent feature suggestion uh, from the motion channels. And while we also introduce some connections to net this, these two branches, these two channels to exchange information with each other. And after multiple stages of suggestion and information change, we eventually we arrive at the petition. So this is a default setup where we use one to eight uh, ratio to for extracting features at different channels. And this is uh, the mo more popular stuff in the, the last couple of years. Uh, we, know, we all know that the transformer has become a very popular uh, model architecture and it leads to a number of issues in natural language processing. So recently, uh, transformer has also been uh, applied to um, video understanding, and we can use it to model uh, long local connections, uh, both spatially and temporally. So this is just an overview, a very, very fast overview uh, of what happens over the past seven, eight years in the area of action recognition and video understanding. And then in the Open MM Lab team also recognize the importance of video understanding. I mean, know that video is the major content that people record their life and share their, their ideas. Uh, so the, the team developed uh, the MM Action Tool. Uh, which is a fundamental work compared to MMS. 
So the key distinguishing aspect of MM Action Tool is that with a single consistent framework, it can support multiple tasks. And in particular, it supports all the three key tasks in action understanding, including action recognition, temporal action localization, and spatial temporal action detection. And it also allows uh, different methods to be uh, implemented under this framework. And it actually provided uh, all the different methods out of the box, including uh, the earlier two stream based methods and later the three dimensional convolutional networks and all representative methods based on 3D convolution, as well as the latest uh, transformer based models. Okay. And this is uh, a unified model design. Okay. So let's consider uh, this is actually two different categories respectively based on uh, 2D and 3D. So we have these two categories of methods. Uh, they are foreign, uh, slightly different uh, paradigms. For two-dimensional uh, convolutional based methods we call vectorized 2D. Mm. And it allows different channels for feature maps such as RGB, uh, images, RGB frames, on optical flows, okay, from multiple segments, multiple snippets, uh, as input. And this input, you might can, even though you can represent the input in a four-dimensional tensor, essentially it has a five dimensions and its number of samples. Segment is the number of segments or snippets that you extract uh, for each video, and then we have number of channels and also the spatial sizes at chain W. Okay. Uh, when you have the, this, um, this snippet and this, uh, this input group into a four dimensional tensor, and then this tensor will then go through a two dimensional backbone networks. Each channel will respectively go through their branch. And the results um, produced from each branch will then be integrated through the consensus module uh, to generate or the final representation and then eventually a classification head will then be applied to the representation to get uh, the uh, final prediction. And for recognizer 3D, instead of relying on multiple streams or multiple channels of each, uh, inputs, it's just relying on the video itself, that which is the contiguous um, uh, video frames. And these frames will then be as um, there's also a five dimensional tensors, the number of frames and then uh, the number of channels and also the number of frames within each instance and the spatial size. So we have the temporal size T, spatial size H by W and the number of channels and the number of, um, of samples. And then this five dimensional input will go through a three dimensional uh, convolutional backbone to get the features. Okay. And the features are represented by an N by C matrix. This feature will then um, be fed into the classification head to make the semantic prediction. And this is a unified model design. And this model design, you can easily replace the design of each individual stage uh, to try your methods uh, quickly. And this just show you the code. And in the left-hand side of this slide, uh, we have this uh, model code uh, to represent a temporal mental network. And here you get to specify the basic type of the model, we call it the recognized 2D, which says that we uh, are based on a two-dimensional uh, convolutional network. Okay. And then we decide the backbone, okay, it's a ResNet with uh, 50 layers. And then we have this uh, color classification head, uh, which specifies how the features uh, come out from the backbone can be used for classification. And now it says uh, it's, you have to specify some basic parameters like number of classes, uh, the types, and how you actually come, come up with the final decision with some consensus function structure. And this is another um, um, representative method called yeah, inflative 3D. So again, we specify the basic type as the backlinezer 3D, and then we specify the backbone. So it's a ResNet 3D, 
and also give 50 layers. Okay. Uh, and then we also specify pretty much similar uh, settings on the head, head part that which connects the, the web presentation and the class labels. So you can see it's a very, very easy to set up the entire network with just a few lines of code when you're using MM Action tool. Okay. And this makes the experiments on MM Action uh, very easy and very efficient. So with the limited time, you can try more methods, uh, try more ideas with MM Action tool. Yeah. And there's another very important feature, which I, which I think is worth mentioning, uh, is to call it unified frame loader. Mm, in this frame loader, uh, uh, you can see, so when you process in video, you have to load the frames and then process them, and then you form the input to the uh, neural network. But for different methods, they want to process the frames in a number of different ways. Fortunately, in MM Machine Tool, we provide all uh, different ways for you to uh, process the video frames. And here we have uh, independent RGB frames for multiple segments. And here, what you only need to do is that you just set up the clip length to be one. So you have to actually set, extract one clip uh, for each interval. Yeah. And, and you extract number of clips, free number of uh, free clips. And then, uh, if you want to have contiguous flow frames for multiple segments, then you can just change the parameters on clip length and also uh, the number of clips. And finally, uh, if you want to train the free network, you want to but the densely sample frames, then you can actually set up a larger numbers to the clip length, which means that each snippet will contain 32 uh, frames. And now we are only want to extract one single clip uh, from uh, this video. Okay. So by specifying those different parameters, you can uh, very easily tune or change the way that you sample information from the video. Okay. So I guess that uh, we have to uh, should come to the end because we only have a uh, to twenty. Uh, minutes and I hope that uh, this sharing can give you a very brief uh, idea of how action understanding evolved uh, over the past seven eight years and how these different methods and different tasks can be supported by uh, MM action tool. Okay, thank you. Uh, so now we can uh, go into the Q and A session. So any questions? It seems that my talk is quite clear. So now let me give back the time to, to Kai. Okay. We can invite the, the next speaker to share. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, and then we will uh, invite uh, Kevin Loy. So I will give a brief introduction. Uh, 